Welcome, podcast listeners, to the Meb Faber Show video series. For our long-term followers, you're probably wondering why we're doing video now. Well, we've been putting out publications for over a decade, and we used to say the reason we launched a podcast, we're now over 200 shows in, is because a little bit was lost with the written word, the narrative, the emotions of speaking and talking. So we've done podcasts, but there's also something lost with podcasting and audio, which is the visuals. And for everyone knows, investing is a big um, visual sort of lifestyle and, and endeavor. Um, and so we want to try something new. We're going to call this something like the chart book uh, series, where each week or maybe each month, we'll see how much work this is, uh, we'll go through and review maybe five or 10 of the best charts, talk about what's going on in the world, um, and let you follow along. So uh, let's get started and see how this goes. Uh, so first, we're going to do some screenshots um, and talk a little bit about some ideas. Well, 2020 has been quite a decade already. If you rewind back to Q4 of 2019, we had a fun tweet in November that said along the lines of, as this decade winds down, it's interesting to reflect how often decades mark major inflection points in investing. At the end of the 1970s, you had this transition from a major uh, inflationary period to the bottom in stocks and bonds and a massive beginning of a huge bull market over the next two decades. The 1980s was a huge decade for Japan. It really became the Japanese decade where their stock market was the biggest in the world and really culminated in the peak of the most expensive stock market of all time. 1990s, again, romping and stomping, ending in the dot-com boom and then bust uh, in, in late 1999. And then, of course, the 2000s, we all recall, ended in the great financial crisis. And we had a fun tweet that said, what's your best guess for this decade to come, starting in 2020? And almost everyone responded something along the lines of crypto. Uh, but three months in, four months in, we already know what's happened. Um, here's a tweet from Carl Richards at Behavior Gap. Uh, who has uh, who can say more in one simple drawing than I can in an hour-long podcast, but has a great description that talks about, I think, uh, illustrates 2020 pretty nicely, which is, it's been wild. Uh, but if you look at the time frame on, on investing, which is really where you should be measuring uh, investing time frame, it's decades. It's not weeks, months, days, quarters, or even years. It's actually decades. It goes back to the old Lenin quote where, uh, I said something along the lines of, you know, there's decades where nothing happened and weeks when decades happen. Well, that's what 2020 feels like so far. Um, and if you were to go back and, and talk to us from even four months ago, I mean, this is a tweet from Matt O'Brien. He said, you know, two months ago, we had the lowest um, unemployment rate in 50 years. A couple months later, we have the highest unemployment rate in 80 years. Just shows how quickly things changed in 2020. Um, and one of the reasons we know is obviously now has been the coronavirus but it created mass chaos, not just on uh, investable assets, but also, of course, on Main Street. Here's a chart from the CEO of Lambda School, Austin Allred, where he talks about you know, how challenging this has been for small business. You know, Half of all small business have a cash buffer to get them through tough times less than a month. And many restaurants, it's as low as 16 days. And, and we kind of have known how this plays out, but it's just a, a good representation of how, how challenging this has been. Um, at least a little bit of humor on on what's going on is um, it's a good tweet it says Keith Richards still has Spanish flu antibodies so he's he's going to be protected at least but as this market sort of imploded uh, with investments and also the economy you know we were tweeting in March where it felt like every day stocks were going up five ten percent down five ten percent futures were up down limit uh, every night you know we were pretty close to printing the worst stocks uh, worst month in stocks ever which was actually minus 30% in 1931, small caps and small cap value were doing even worse. Uh, you know, they were at one point down uh, almost 50% this year. And so um, this volatility, you know, one day in March, the stock market was up 8% in a single day. And we look back in history and said, when have we even seen these up or down 8% days? And if you look at the years, it's not actually a list of laundry list of great times to invest. Uh, the late 1920s and the Great Depression took up most of the list, the financial crisis in 1987, and then 2020. Um, you know, if, for those who followed us for a long enough time, you can go to my day job, Camry Investments. If you click on Investing Insights and down to White Papers, uh, you can find a lot of free reads, including uh, 
a bunch of our books for free, but um, one of the papers that we wrote, there's some of the books, uh, was called um, Where the Black Swans Hide. And it talks about, you know, this volatility uh, back in history. Look at me, that's a young Meb with a clean shaven and a tie uh, and a lot of hair. Um, but we talked about the majority of these really big up and down days occur when the market's already declining. And the reason being is that it's about two thirds of the, both the good and the bad days occur after the market's already been declining. And the reason being is that uh, people use a different part of their brain when they're uncertain and fearful. Uh, so you see this massive introduction of volatility. Uh, and uh, this happens all around the world. It's a fun paper, old paper. Uh, here's, here's another funny tweet that summarizes how we kind of all felt in the beginning of the year versus a month later, for those that have seen the movie. But, you know, the challenge with investing is I feel like most people really get stuck with a binary view of the future uh, or a binary position. And there's a lot of reasons why, you know, the, the behavioral imbalances of how we value something once we hold it or have bought something. Now, if you think about all the junk in your garage and why uh, you still all hold all of that, would you go buy all that stuff again? No chance, right? Um, and so most people love to think in a binary terms with investing, whether it's for gambling or cheering for a sports team. And so we had a tweet in March and said, look, people, um, look, friends, you have to at least consider both outcomes in your head, because I'm pretty sure no one considered the first three months of this year of a huge pandemic uh, infecting the entire world and causing chaos in financial markets. So you have to at least think about the possibilities. So are you prepared? And this is probably in the depths of March when the market was down about a third for the stock market to return all time highs or it declined 50 percent from here and 50 percent down from where we were in March would take us back to about the lows of global financial crisis valuations. So not out of that question, uh, I said, you know, personally and also your portfolios need to be prepared for either outcome as possible. Um, and if we learn anything from 2020, we know that it is possible. And so here's what a bunch of major traditional assets have done year to date. I'm not using any of our funds. These are just some common ETFs. You can find them up here. Um, but obviously, we wrote a, a white paper called Worried About the Market that talks about tail risk. And we said when the U.S. stock market does really poorly, whether over a month, a day, or a year, what assets do you expect to help? Um, and what assets do you expect not to help? And the ones you expect not to help, foreign stocks, real estate, commodities, didn't help again in 2020. The ones you would expect to help, um, mainly being bonds, almost universally helped. Gold uh, helps some of the time, but not always. I think there was a, m a month where the uh, stock market did minus 10 and gold did minus 15, but it, gold's done well this year. And then some active strategies like trend following and certainly tail risk have done really well this year. But if you look at traditional assets, um, tops, of course, was bonds up 10% this year. Pretty smooth ride. Uh, precious metals about the same ballpark. And then this laundry list of nastiness. You know, the stock market in the U.S. is um, almost down uh, less than 10% now. And I, I believe NASDAQ is actually up which is astonishing. And then you look at everything else, which is gets gross and grosser. You have emerging markets still down 15, IFA down 17, uh, small caps down 20, real estate 20, uh, foreign real estate 25, broad-based commodities, especially energy down 30, and small cap value down uh, uh, in, the, in the rear. But at one point in March, a lot of this stuff was down a third to 50%. And uh, even, um, even precious metals were down. But we said this in March 24th, we said you got to be prepared for either scenario, this to keep going down, Great Depression style, or market could go back up. And most people, I don't think, are, are prepared for both scenarios. Um, and as you think about markets and everything different going on, you know, we were talking about oil. And for those that were following oil and all the craziness that were going on in the futures, one of the first times ever you've seen a future contract actually trade negative. Uh, a lot of the short-term imbalances that the virus has created you know, I said, for those that use trend following, and we'll get into this more later, why it's such a great philosophy is that, you know, so many people in the good times focus on one thing and only, and that's gains. You know, how much money can I make? And uh, the bigger challenge is the, the goal of investing is, is not to maximize gains. Look, that's great. Uh, but 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, if you make 8% or 10, will it make a huge difference? If you make 15 or 17, will it make a huge difference? Probably not. If you make eight or zero, that is a big difference, or eight or minus 10. 
you know, the first goal is, is not to maximize returns. In my opinion, it's to stay in the game. And that, I don't care if that's it. you're in Vegas, if you're betting, uh, any sort of uh, investments. If you don't have a bankroll, you can't play. I'm trying to teach my three-year-old that. Um, and so you've seen a lot of different uh, crazy takeaways. Uh, you know, Phil Huber says something about Exxon. And the weight in 2008 was double the weight of the energy sector today, which has reigned, I think, from a peak. The energy sector was about a quarter of the S&P 500. Now it's down to about 3%, which is insane to think about. Um, historically, by the way, one of our old posts uh, talk about buying industries and sectors that are down 60, 80, 90%. You guys can go run all the data yourself at French Fama. You can download the data for free. Shows that historically buying things that have been completely decimated has worked out well over in the next three to five years. So maybe there's some opportunity in the energy patch. Um, this is a humorous tweet uh, that shows the best trade of all time, which was a uh, pretty large divorce settlement from Harold Hamm, uh, a famous uh, wildcatter, I believe in the Dakotas. But he managed to fit a almost billion dollar check uh, on, uh, on, on one check. So he said pretty good timing uh, of, his, um, uh, of his wife on divorcing him. But, you know, the funny thing is if you look back over this past year and I said, look, let's blind yourself to what's going on. Let's just try to use some common sense here for a minute. And I told you, and this could have applied at any point in history, but I said, all right, 12 months ago to today, unemployment in the United States will go from 4% to 15%, it's actually probably 20, but I did this tweet uh, about a month ago. Interest rates in the Fed fall from two and a half to zero. Purchasing managers index, expansionary territory goes from 50 to 37. Gold's up by about a third, stock volatility triples and oil's down 70%. And I, then I said, and oh, by the way, over the past 12 months, stocks are up. When I did this tweet, they were flat, now they're up. Would you believe me? And almost universally, everyone says, no, that's crazy. You know, there's a massive stress going on uh, in the world. And, and also valuations are still high, which is kind of a um, surprise. You know, I think most people said, well, this would maybe make sense if valuations were super low or even average, but, but they're still high in the U.S. Um, this is actually a tweet we did from, from Q4. And I imagine as we do this going forward, it'll probably only be once, once a week or once a month. But uh, this, this one's encompassing last six months. But we talked about stock returns of the past decade. I mean, remember again, spreading your time horizon out. And I said, as we come close to putting a bow on the returns of the past decade, some perspective and, and average after inflation uh, for the past, I guess, 12 decades or so, stocks return about 6.6% .6 per year. You add on the inflation, you get to that historical about 10% number. The worst was the early 2000s, minus 3% per year. And the best was the 1950s, nifty 50s, 16% plus year. Again, add inflation or over 20. Um, and we, fin we finished this past decade in one of the top five. And then we said, is this predictive at all? And we said, well, if you look at the three worst decades, the 70s, the 10s, the 2000s, the average returns were minus 2% real, future returns were 12%. That's great. If you looked at the three best decades, the Roaring Twenties, Nifty Fifties, 1990s, Internet Bubble, average return was 15% and the future returns the next decade were almost zero. So there is some mean reversion, at least historically, and we were in the top half, so not hugely predictive, um, maybe a bit of a headwind. But the bigger problem was that um, after the worst decades, you know, valuations were subdued. Makes sense. After things went down for a decade, the PE on average was only around 12 uh, and then that sets the stage for a big multiple expansion over the next decade. And after the three best decades, valuations were 28, setting the stage for big headwinds. And so at the end of 2019, we had one of the best performing decades. We also had one of the highest valuations. So we said, summary, celebrate the hell out of this great 10-year run, but sober up soon, take your medicine, consider a decade in the future with lower stock returns. Um, now, obviously, none of that could have predicted a global pandemic, but it does show that um, coming into this, U.S. stocks were expensive. And the odd part is, despite all the um, fury of the first three, four months of the year, we're kind of back to where we were. So um, we send out a quarterly uh, CAPE ratio, uh, excuse me, valuation, global stock valuation um, summary for all the 45 countries in the world uh, of developed and emerging markets um, each quarter to an investment service we have called the Idea Farm.
And uh, here's a summary of the, of the main indices. And, and we showed that at the end of March, so we do this every three months, they've come up since then, U.S. had gone from year end <clears throat> around 31 to 23. It's back up around 28 now. Foreign developed 22, which is totally reasonable valuation. It got as low as 17. Foreign emerging was already cheap at 16, got to 11. And if you were to do emerging market small cap or value, it was in single digits. And then if you bucketed it instead of by development um, stage, rather by valuations, the, the quarter most expensive went from 28 to 22. The middle went from 17 to uh, 12. And the cheapest went from 12 to 9. Uh, which is a pretty, pretty big valuation gap. And, you know, again, thinking about valuations this is not something I think that these are CAPE ratios, 10 year price to earnings ratios. So very long term, we track uh, 10 year price to, uh, price to dividends, book, cash flow, all these. And in general, if you're looking to the right of the decimal place, you're doing it the wrong way. In general, they uh, play out over the t time frame of a decade. And here's an article from 1950s. And this is Sir John Templeton, where he's talking about valuations. And he said, look, um, how much you should have in equity is it should just be a stair step ladder down based on how expensive they are. And, you know, he said it's not that that complicated. Well, um, again, the problem is a lot of people coming into this year and still think that the U.S. deserves a massive uh, overweight based on um, its place in the world and performance and everything else. But one of the problems is the U.S. valuations are one of the biggest spreads they've ever been to foreign. And this continues today. This chart isn't updated to, to current. You would just see a couple more zigs on the right side of the chart. Um, but the whole point of this tweet, which is from February, was that a lot of people assume that the U.S. always trades at a valuation premium to foreign markets. And that's not true. Since 1980, there has been no valuation premium. It's actually incorrect. If you look at the chart, it was 0.001 uh, on the P.E. ratio of the U.S. premium. But we have this massive premium today uh, of the U.S. versus foreign. So one of the best opportunities, we've been talking about this for three years now, if not longer, uh, probably five years, um, to, to diversify away from the U.S. into foreign particularly emerging markets, emerging market small cap value, uh, or the cheapest uh, bucket of countries. The problem, of course, is everyone in the U.S., 80 percent of the people put their money in, the, in, this, in their own country. They do it everywhere. France, Germany, Netherlands, Switzerland, Italy, Spain, Japan, Australia. Everyone puts almost all their money into their own market. This major home country bias is one of the dumbest uh, behavioral biases there is. And it's not necessarily as bad if you live in Japan, US, UK, um, or some, this is a, a, a tweet about the concentration of some of the top indices and ETFs, where you find out that the top 10 holdings are these very um, undiversified exposures. And so the whole point of investing is you want breadth, you want the whole world. So anyway, um, foreign got really cheap. Uh, we think that at a minimum, the starting point should be the global market portfolio, which means you should put half in U.S. stocks and half in foreign. No one does that, particularly in the U.S. If you're value conscious, you would put even more and tilt away, maybe even towards GDP weight, which is the U.S. is only about a quarter of world GDP. Um, and then if you look at within the U.S. market, you know, markets aren't tr traditionally just homogenous. There's not just one U.S. market, but you saw that things like small cap value, and here's our bud Patrick O'Shaughnessy talking about it, and you can click through to see this research piece about how small cap value got absolutely destroyed in the first quarter, uh, presenting big opportunities where the valuations came down uh, to really low levels. And you see from our friends at Luthold, where we had Doug Ramsey on the podcast too, where he talks about some of these valuations. And if you look at mid cap value and small cap value, certainly relative to uh, large market cap weighted, you're getting really low valuations. Um, but, you know, the nice thing about some of these crisis events, if there is a silver lining, is that it, it re-educates investors on how challenging and difficult investing is. You know, we've talked a lot about on the podcast how we want to do a paper, and we still might, about um, so many times when crisis happens, people say, hey, it's okay, clients, this has happened before, it's not a big deal. But we used to always say we want to write some papers called It's Okay, Clients. This has never happened before. And the definition of an uncertain future is you're going to see things that have never happened. And so this year, there's numerous things that have never happened. If you go back to 2017, 
There's numerous things that never happened before on the positive side. 2017, first calendar year in history, stock market was up every single month. I used to laugh when people talked about these volatile markets back in 2017. I was like, what are you talking about? This is the least volatile market you've ever seen. Fast forward to this year, we had the fastest period ever where the stock market went from an all-time high to a bear market. It was under a month. Just If you guys remember back, just absolute just bludgeoning over the course of a very short period. Um, and these are sort of things that you experience that have never experienced before, but you have to be prepared for that. Um, and, and one of them, sorry, I skipped over, was one of the most universal beliefs. I bet if you ask Twitter or any polls, it's probably 98% of people would say, do you believe that stocks outperform bonds over a long period? Almost everyone would say yes. But you had a period, and this was in March, when the U.S. stock market was getting pummeled, where U.S. stocks had not outperform long-term bonds for 40 years. And why does that matter? You know, um, we do poll after poll. There's been institutions, there's institutional study that said, how long would you give your smart beta manager? Uh, how long would you tolerate it before you had to sell uh, with them underperforming? And 95% was less than two or three years. So I replicated this, this is actually pre-crisis. Um, and I said the same thing to our audience, how long would you tolerate it? And over half said less than three years and 85% said less than six years. And here I am, I just told you the most universal belief that stocks underperform bonds, but all of a sudden people were saying they can't uh, handle a couple years underperformance and, and stocks went 40. So this mismatch between what people's expectations are and reality um, causes so many behavioral problems in stocks. We go back to the, our uh, one of our favorite quotes by Mark Yusko, which says, you know, investing is the only business when things go on sale, everyone runs out of the store. This is a good illustration as to why people have this terrible mismatch on expectations. You saw a lot of weird stresses in the first quarter. Um, a lot of index funds and index and passive has, has um, increasingly become a meaningless term. You had to go back to the 1970s to really understand that uh, indexing and passive meant just market cap weighting full stop. And what people assumed was the major innovation there. They always assumed it's passive and indexing, but that's not it. Uh, it's what passive indexing enabled, which was low cost investing. And I think John Bogle really understood that. But indexing actually has a lot of disadvantages. Um, one of which is, is we laugh being a quantitative shop because we're rules based. We manage both index and passive funds. Um, but how many indexes did you see in the first quarter that decided randomly with discretion to just not rebalance? They're like, you know what, we're going to skip this one, which is crazy. You know, it's, it's not the worst thing in the world, um, probably, but it's just a weird override. And then in some cases, they got all mixed up and Invesco had to pay a $100 million check uh, because they forgot to rebalance one of their funds. Um, and then interactive brokers got into a lot of trouble because they didn't know that uh, futures contracts could go negative. So um, the inability to foresee possibilities of what could happen in the future gets a lot of people and companies into trouble. The good news is a lot of things uh, got skipped over in Q1 as positive news. You now have a scenario where, um, and we've been saying this for five, seven years now, um, buy and hold market cap weighting is becoming a commodity. And what I mean by that is, and this illustrates it, Matt Haugen, one of our good friends on the podcast, has shown that you can buy a portfolio of ETFs, the global market portfolio, stocks, bonds, foreign, commodities, for about five basis points. That's 0.05%, which is essentially free. And if you include short lending, it already has a negative expense ratio. So you're probably getting paid to own that allocation. And then you've had a bunch of funds in the last year that have straight up just launched 0% fee funds. Bank of New York Mellon just came out with a large cap uh, and bond fund at 0%. So you'll continue to see this. The odd part is that the average mutual fund cost is still 1.25%. Not dollar weighted, I get it's probably less, but still it's more than zero. Um, and the vast majority of people willingly pay that tax, um, either just because they're lazy or they want to. Uh, but uh, for market cap weighting, you're essentially, over the next decade, you're gonna see this barbell between low cost, zero cost, market cap weighted, free indices, and then people who are still generating or trying to generate alpha through different strategies and doing it, um, you gotta be pretty weird and different. And most people aren't, they just wanna hug the indices, uh, which, which is not worth paying for.
But look around the world, and it's even worse outside the U.S. This is an article from Bloomberg that talks about, um, you know, I said, you think your pension fund is garbage. This one charges up to 4%, and all it does is hold a couple ETFs. So uh, all these toll keepers around the world that just grift and take a fee for doing nothing, uh, the beauty of the Internet being a great disinfectant is that uh, that's hopefully going to change in the coming decade. But the good news is, once how do you set all this up to get rid of your uh, bias? Michael Batnick talked about this, but this is a study from Fidelity, which talked about, hey, look, employees who just auto enroll into a 401k usually behave pretty uh, decently. You know, those who don't end up with a much lower um, enrollment rate or opting out. Uh, so coming up with these all-in-one solutions, the automated services by Vanguard, by Betterment, we think Schwab are fantastic. Um, you know, again, people are still using a lot of mutual funds. We talked about fees. We talked about performance. The least sexy is taxes, which are coming up soon. But you got to remember a lot of these old school active equity mutual funds has a massive uh, tax um, hindrance versus ETFs just by the structure. And we estimate it in many cases about 0.7% per year, which is more important than the delta between um, fees. So Ryan Curlin talks about this with, with some of the DFA funds. Um, and our bud Rick Ferry uh, says he's been warming up the idea of one fund. You're done for most investors. Rick, I love it. I agree with you. We're going to wind it down. A couple quick hits, a couple uh, humorous ideas, tweets. This is one that's uh, a chart from my favorite read of the year. If you haven't read it, my favorite book, Triumph the Optimist. But this is the quarter uh, yearly update uh, called the Global Investment Returns Yearbook. You can look up yearly versions of it. This year, they tackle some industries. They go to show that, uh, not surprisingly, one of the best performing industries in history was tobacco companies, probably also one of the most deadly. But it's worth a great read uh, for perspective on what's happened in markets. There's been a couple times when stock markets straight up shut down. You lost all your wealth. China, Russia, looking at you. In other countries, markets had pretty terrible returns over the past 120 years. Austria, I think South Africa was the best. U.S. is, is one of the best, uh, but not the best. And there's a fun chat this week with Stan Druckenmiller. You started to hear a lot of these big macro guys come out, uh, talk about um, their concerns with valuations. You know, it's it's uh, hard to follow the discretionary macro guys, but Tepper and Druckenmiller, even Warren Buffett sounded pretty bearish. It was hard to listen to. Anyway, this was a, uh, thank God I'm a, qua a quant. Otherwise, I would be probably the most bearish person on the planet. But I follow my rules, thankfully. And, and there's no other bigger disconnect, by the way, than the pessimism of being a public market investor consistently watching TV and like Bloomberg and CNBC, listening to podcasts. Almost all the news flow in the media is negative. And on the flip side, with private companies investing in startups, it's just like the most optimistic thing on the planet. I encourage listeners, even if you don't do private investing, try to follow some of the uh, private uh, investing networks like AngelList, uh, and, and WeFunder and others because it uh, will make you a lot more optimistic on the future versus just listening to what public markets are doing. Um, here's a fun one. This is from Meredith Frost. Just going to show some beautiful paintings. These are actually uh, uh, real canvases that appear to be wrapped in cla uh, plastic but really painted by the artist himself. Isn't that gorgeous? Robin Ellie, Ile, Starry Night. And then here is... My, see if you guys can hear the sound. This is Bezos overlaid with the Imperial March. Soon to be probably the world's first two trillion dollar company. They are crushing it this year. And lastly, what do we have lastly? Nothing. That's it. Um, well, look, investors, do you guys think this was fun? Should we keep doing these? Um, we're open to it. I uh, would love to hear your feedback. Hit us a note, feedback at themebfabershow.com. Give us some suggestions, weekly, monthly, I don't know. Different format, different person, different host. Let me know. Thanks for listening, friends. Be safe and sanitary and good investing. Matt Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com.